What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Don't Give Up the Ship Podcast. This is episode 79. Uh, and today I'm talking to John Rennie. Uh, he is an author, uh, a speaker, of, a man of many uh, talents, Run does works in manufacturing, uh, but he was a submarine officer back in the 90s, if you can believe that, so long ago. <laughs> um, but he was uh, he's somebody that some friends of mine have talked to over the Test Depth uh, platform. If you if you don't listen to them, go check out Only on the Midwatch podcast. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, just he reached out. I, th- I thought to myself, it would be a really interesting contrast to see what type of leadership principles from the military and the submarine force transfer over to the civilian world and how those were successful or not and ask some questions about some of the things that that he was able to use successfully or not successfully and why and and just we we talked about a lot of different things uh i had a really great time talking to him and i hope you guys enjoy this check it out yeah like i mean just like we talked about we'll start first with just kind of your background um not yeah obviously in the navy um but also the follow-on uh development through the manufacturing world and and into the leadership positions and also like definitely curious in in how because you you don't necessarily you're in a leadership position but your your job or jobs as you progress in the civilian world weren't specifically leadership focused. So like, how did you become so passionate about leadership as well? But we'll start with your bio and then we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm a strange guy. I'm one of the guys that actually <laughs> wanted to go into the submarine force. I, yeah. I, you know, my, I had two, two grandfathers in world war two and I, for some reason, got fascinated with um, submarine warfare in World War II as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, and read stories about, you know, these famous submarine commanders and all their daring raids and all the things they did. And for whatever reason, that just clicked with me as something I wanted to do someday. And uh, so I decided early on, probably even in high school, I mean, before high school, I said, I, I'd like to be a submarine officer. I got to huh. figure out how to do that. And I had no idea how to do that. Yeah. So, um, figured out I had to go to, you know, have a technical degree. Probably, um, I had to, you know, you know, go through for, for me, it was going through the whole nuclear, uh, pipeline, going to nuke school and prototype and in, in, in sub school, I had to yeah. figure all that out. So I actually went to engineering school, uh, at Worcester Polytech up in Worcester, Mass mm-hmm. and got an engineering degree in mechanical engineering when went to the fleet was on the USS Tennessee, uh, for, really five years. I spent a year, yeah. you know, obviously in training and four years on the Tennessee and, uh, was a JO, typical JO did a, mm-hmm. a JO tour. We did seven patrols during my time. The Tennessee Jeez. was brand new. So she was getting after runs. it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, so I spent a lot of time, uh, at sea and, uh, then I went right, you know, I left, left the Navy, went into the corporate world. Like a lot of people do went into yeah. corporate America. I spent uh, 22 years in corporate America. I started as a design engineer, working on small teams, doing product development. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, there, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but I uh, felt this need to be useful. Like I was like back on the boat, yeah. right? I had to get qualified. <laughs> and so I really spent a lot of time learning my job and learning uh, how I could be a, a, a best service to the company. And through that, I began to learn so many different skills and I became an expert in like nuclear quality because we made products for nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, I became expert in quality systems. I became an expert in engineering systems. So I eventually got promoted to quality manager, then engineering manager. And then at 32 years old, I got my first manufacturing plant to lead. And then from then on for the rest of my career, I led eight different manufacturing plants uh, during that time all over Mm -hmm. the East Coast. And then um, about six years ago, I just left corporate and I started my own company. I started my own manufacturing business. Uh, And I decided that I was done with corporate. I gave them a good 22 years, uh, but uh, it was time for me to go on on my own. I started my own manufacturing company. And uh, yeah, I started started doing that. And before I left corporate though, I, I began to realize that that my career was rather unique, right? Yeah. Not many people go in to the civilian world and then end up being, you know, plant manager for eight different plants. And I never expected to do that, never wanted to do that. I really didn't have a desire to do that, but it just happened. And it mostly yeah. happened because uh, of the training that I had in the Navy was the, was the experience I had on the boat. Mm-hmm. really provided me a really unique set of skills that I 
that I didn't realize until the last 10 years or so that I was like, oh, I am different than everybody else yes. around here. Yeah. And I kept trying to figure out what made what made me different. And yeah. that's when I I started writing and I started um, you know, uh, writing for different different uh, websites. I started a blog uh, mm. and eventually started a podcast and wrote a couple of books. And so, and I think people have really attached to the kind of things I'm trying to teach. So I've, I've had some, I've got some military experience. I've got some, you know, corporate experience and now startup experience. So I think I'm bringing a unique set of skills to the leadership arena. Yeah. It's interesting to me that like, so the, the, I, I want to loop back because we talked a bunch before I clicked record because of course we did. Cause I always do this, but <laughs> the, the concept of, of making yourself useful, we talked about a little bit and yeah, it's interesting to me that like, because my, my brother separated, he was uh, first on the, the Roosevelt deployed in the day after September 11th. Oh, All wow. he did was deploy and deploy and deploy to war zones wow. and then got out of the military. And so he was like hyper adapted to this type of environment where he was doing the work of 10 men. And so right. like when he got out of the military, he had a really hard time adapting to civilian life and like slowing down. And he ended up in inside six months, he had three part-time jobs and was going to business school full-time. And he was still just like, I give me more. Like, I don't, I, I, I don't know how these people exist this way. He's like, I just need more to do. And, uh, it was the idea of you. So like when you s s transitioned out of the military into these organizations and you're approaching it from a place where you're just like you would if you showed up to a new submarine, like, I, okay, right, I need to get right. qualified. I need to become useful to the organization. Yeah. Um, like how, how did you see that interpreted by that, uh, by the group of people that were largely, I would assume not military veterans and just people that probably didn't quite understand what you were trying to accomplish and, and like why you were approaching it in the way that you were. Yeah, no, it's true. I, I I actually wrote a little bit about it in in my my uh, latest book. It's a chapter called "Earn Your Oxygen." And <laughs> one of the things I I felt like on the boat was like, you know, as a, as a JO as an ensign, I showed up to the boat as an ensign, yeah, uh, and I was clueless. I thought, you know, I thought all this training, you know, the Navy said I was ready for the fleet. I can tell you this, I was not ready for the fleet. Yeah, the, no uh, one's ever ready for the fleet. But, you know, I remember being on the boat and I remember just talking with some of the junior officers and just saying, is there anything I can do? I feel like a useless. I could feel completely useless. Yeah. And that's when I met the uh, the battery charging lineup officer, the guy yeah. who was the uh, lineup officer for the first, for the last patrol. And he says, you could get qualified for this. And that's what I did. <laughs> and uh, let's talk about the boat about how, on, uh, in my book about how I did that job and that gave me a feeling of being useful. Yeah. Right? I wasn't qualified or anything on anything else. Right. I was still, uh, still a nub, you know, but yeah. I, I could do something and contribute. And so I took that even into when I left the fleet, went into, um, went into civilian work. I really felt that way. I felt like, wow, everybody's got something to do. I had nothing to do and right. I didn't know what to do. Right. And there wasn't a qual card. Nobody handed me a qual card. Yeah. And said, yeah. Hey, good luck. Right. So. Um, uh, so. So I found myself trying to figure out what to do. And uh, I remember talking to different engineers in the department. I said, uh, you know, do you mind if I tag along with you? And they said, what do you mean? I was like, when you ever go, you go down on the shop floor and the manufacturing floor, take me with you. I want to figure out what you do. I want to figure out what this role is. I don't really understand it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and so I did that a few times and then we had a department meeting with our engineering department and I just said the same thing. I said, if you guys are doing something interesting, please come get me. I said, I right. want to learn. I don't know what I'm doing here yet. I don't know how I can contribute, but I want to learn what you what you do. So I, I ended up being like a, like a puppy dog, uh, yeah. just following people around, trying and asking a lot of questions and trying to learn it. But it was all from the standpoint is I wanted to earn my oxygen. I wanted to <laughs> be a value to to the company. And, uh, I yeah. felt like they were, they were paying me money at they, you know, and I felt like I wasn't contributing. So I think <clears throat> that mindset led to just kind of, for me, at least digging in, learning and doing everything that I could to become, you know, become effective and become a useful employee. But one of the things that, one of the things I learned and, uh, and a lot of people probably getting out, learn that is the pace of, uh, corporate life is so much slower than the boats. Yeah. And so I found myself just 
you know, it, it was, wasn't, it wasn't difficult to outperform my peers and, but I wasn't doing it on purpose though. You right. know, I was like, my pace of work was so much faster than what I was used to in terms of the way things are done. And, um, and when I, I, I was fortunate enough to be in a company that they recognized that, 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 that yeah. I needed more to do and that I could <laughs> do more. And so I was given, given greater and greater responsibility, but my wife kind of summed it up one time. She said, you know what I've noticed about your career you've been dragged kicking and screaming up the corporate ladder. In other words, I, I was pulled up the corporate ladder. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to do it. I wasn't yeah. looking for my next job. I just, I became ext- extremely good at what I did and then they, I was asked to do more. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's, that's ideally what you want to be able to do is to be useful, be effective. And then someone says, you know what, we want you to take a greater role. And yeah. uh, I think that's, that's the way I approached my career. And as it turned out, you know, it was very successful in what I did but I think it came from those, it was, it's really was grown up on the boat and, and, and yeah. grew up through those trust trying to be useful. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I'm laughing so hard at the earn your oxygen because I had a cob that would routinely talk about like the people that were underperforming and weren't qualified and were delinquent. He would just say they're sitting around stealing oxygen. So yeah. like, I, yeah, that's pretty funny. Uh, do you, did you find that because at, like, so as you function that the way you just described in in your work environment did you find that one people kind of had a problem with the fact Mm. that that you were constantly like hey can i tag along hey can i learn from you hey can come get me when you're doing these things like did they view that in in a in a negative light like you were trying to outperform and and basically like to either take their job or like learn from them so that you could get ahead etc and that the fact that you were just outperforming them based on the fact that that's just like we're we're rev to a, like the red line all the time on the boat and so like you're just doing what you're used to doing but they're they might view it negatively as like you're trying to make them all look bad or something like like that kind of that yeah. kind of they're comparing themselves to you and and understanding that they probably can't do what you're doing, but they're also jealous that they can't, that they're not going to get recognized in the same way, even though that's not necessarily why you were doing it. Did you get any, any negative uh, kind of side effects of you approaching it that way? Yeah. You know, that's, it's really interesting because there was that. And, you know, one thing, one thing about on in the, in the military, especially on the boats, you, you, you didn't, you didn't progress unless you, you earned it. Right. Right. You, you had to do your time, you know, time in that rank, you had to, you know, get to your, to get to your next level, you had to earn it. Right. Right. So, um, that was my, always my mindset. I'm, I I don't know when I'm going to get to this next level. I have to earn it. I'm not, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I wasn't trying to shortcut anything. However, I did earn it faster than other people because of the work I put into it and the recognition I got for the different things I did. Well, I did get a reputation they, they called me the golden child for a while. So, <laughs> so I was the golden child and everything yeah. I touched turned to gold and I yep. was special. And, uh, I've you been know, that guy too. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> especially when I got my first plant at, at 32 years old, I got my first manufacturing plant and there was a lot of people at that point that were kind of jealous yeah. that had been in the trenches a long time. And then who's this young 32 year old that, that, that we're promoting into, he's yep. never run a plant before. What does he know? And so yeah, there was, was a, there was some jealousy and, um, you know, I think the way I handled it is like, look, I, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't necessarily ask to be, you know, I, I was asked to do this job, but I wasn't trying to get this job, you know? And yeah. I think, um, I think a lot, a lot of people who knew me knew my personality, which was, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, creating problems in my wake. Right. I wasn't right. destroying everything just to get to my next job. I was right. doing my job competent, competently and then was given more responsibility. So I, there were some people that were jealous, but yeah. Overall, people who knew me knew that that's not who I was. Yeah. And that's kind of how I like I was I had a similar career trajectory where it was like, but there was some there was some of that there. It was always present, but it was not. Super calm, like the people that knew me well knew that all I was trying to do is help and add yeah. to the add to mission accomplishment, make the organization better, whatever. And that was actually something I wanted to bring up was that like um, it was kind of one of your blogs I was going through. It, you're talking about how people need practice to lead. Right. And one of the things that I, I question a lot is I, so I was a nine and a half year chief and that's fast, but it's not the fastest, you know, like I've known guys that have made it in like seven years and I've always questioned, like I was barely ready 
uh, and the, honestly, the only reason I didn't make it the year before is because I went through a divorce. And so my, my qual mm-hmm. progress came to a screeching halt as I dealt with that. Right. Um, but I've seen guys make it in about seven years and I, I sit there and I look at it and I'm just like, like, it's not like they're not great people and it's not like they didn't deserve some type of validation or recognition. But when I, I look at and analyze what I need and expect from a chief petty officer, it's like, I, I kind of look at it like you need experience to be effective yeah. in that role. Like you need what you like, how you described the, you need the practice, like you just need the reps. And it's like, you could be the most naturally gifted leader on the planet and you could be the most intelligent human being I've ever met in my life. And you can, you could have even studied this in a book passionately for a long time. And it it's not that you won't eventually succeed, but what I see happen is, the leaders that get put in those roles so early just take a lot of lumps and then they learn yeah. and then they evolve. And then after they get those reps and they might have done it faster than other people, but they take some punches in the face and I did too. And yeah. so that's the yeah. thing that I'm curious how you feel about that. And if you see that same thing in, in maybe in your career progression, because it happened quickly or in others in the yeah. civilian world of like, when you do get when you have an individual achiever, because I, I was that person where I was like, I did all the things and I, I overachieved the entire time to get to that place so quickly. But then I got there and it was like, oh, crap, like I'm like, <laughs> oh, now I have to be the chief. And now I, I, everybody's looking at me like I have this depth and breadth of experience that I don't necessarily have. Yeah. And so it was it was a handicap for me, for sure. Like I, I had a lot of trouble in my first year as a chief, year and a half maybe, um, before I started to really feel comfortable wearing anchors to work. So I'm curious to to know like how you view that and what your experience has been. Yeah, no, you know, the one thing you can you can learn and study and you can read and you can, you know, become you can learn a lot of things, right? But you can't shortcut experience, right? right. Experience means you gotta put the reps in. You've got to you gotta spend time you know, doing the job. I think leadership is one of those things that you have to start off small. You have to small start off leading small groups, right. you know, get, get more and more responsibility. And over time, you kind of perfect your craft as far as your ability to lead, uh, make decisions, um, set directions, what have you. So I think, yeah, I think you should start off small and, and grow. Um, the one thing that I felt like I had a superpower when I uh, was promoted to plant manager at 32 um, was that I was in that same spot that I was on the boat on day one, which was I was an unqualified young officer and I was in charge. In in my case, I was the reactor controls officer on my yeah. first patrol. So I'm looking around at my team of, uh, you know, my chief and my sailor, sailors having vastly more experience uh-huh. and knowledge than I did, <laughs> right? And yet somehow the Navy felt that I was in charge, right? Right. And so one of the things that I learned through that experience was was how to tap into the most experienced people I have, right. you know, working for right. me and um and earning their respect. I mean, that was that's a big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you show up and, you know, you're you're in charge, you know, you got butter bars and you're in charge of this team and you haven't earned it. <laughs> right? right. So right. so that's a really really awkward position to be in. So yeah. I think building a rapport with my team, my chief, those early days uh, and showing them that, look, I don't have the answers. You have the answers, but I, but I have the role as officers, as an officer to protect you, represent you, right. um, do the things that you, you can't do. There's only certain, there's certain things that the the division officer does. I want to do those. I want to do them really well mm. and, and really I respect you, all your knowledge and, and experience, but I'm going to help you in the doing the things that you can't do. Right. So, yeah. so that was just finding my role was, you know, that wasn't, it didn't happen overnight, but it was, is how do I tap into these experienced people? How do I show them that I'm here to represent them and to, and to, uh, to take care of them. Right. Yeah. Um, even if I'm not as skilled and experienced. So that, that having had done, done that as a JO, really helped me when I got my first plant because I felt I was in that same position again. I was looking at people that had been at that plant for 30 years mm-hmm. and I was, you know, 32 years old. Right. So yeah. how do, how do you leave the plant when you're that young? And it was all about, um, part of it is, is actually being, and this is, this is kind of a funny word, but I'll use it is vulnerable and vulnerable doesn't mean weak. 
but it yeah. means that you're willing to put your ego aside and listen to the experienced people on your team yep. and really tap into that experience. You know, one of the things I do when I take over a manufacturing plant is I meet with all of my experienced employees, the people that have been there a long time. And I say to them, you know, what's, what's working well, what's, what needs to be fixed and if you were in my shoes, what would you do first? And so I have these one-on-one -on -one yeah. meetings with all the experienced people. And what I find is that uh, typically after all those meetings, it co all the ideas coalesce around two to three different things that need yep. to be done like right away. And typically I do those things. I listen yeah. to them. Of course, you, you know, as, as a leader, you got to make a decision. You got to do it. But I typically take action on those few items. And then I gain a lot of early respect in an organization because they're like, oh, he he listens, right? right? And he, he he sorts through all the garbage and he, he finds the one or two gems and then he takes action on them. So this is the kind of person I want to work for. He right. listens to us and takes action. Now, it doesn't mean that um, no matter what you tell me I'm going to do, it means that I'm going to, but, but that's going to go into that. It go, goes into the hopper, right? Okay, that's mm -hmm. that's a problem. And I've heard three other people say that that's a problem. Now, okay, that's that's got to be an issue here, right? This right. is something to look at and take. So, it, so to be honest with you, you know, it's really about tapping into when you don't have experience, right? It's tapping into the experienced people around you yeah. and, and using their wisdom from from the years of doing what they do to be able to make the best decisions for that team. So. Yeah, I'm a giant. At, so first of all, the vulnerability thing I love because I'm a giant Brene Brown fan. Uh, mm, thank yeah. you, Jeff Bayless. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> the the idea of not so not just the experienced people, but what I've learned all, as well is like the more I involve people and let them have a, like an ownership stake in the process and the decision making, mm. even if they're not the most experienced person in the room, but they're the person that's on the floor doing the work, right? Or in the gallery yeah. doing the work or whatever. Yeah. The, if I sit down with them and have a conversation with them and allow them to have an ownership stake in that process so that when we're doing the thing, the way in which we're doing it is not just me dictating to them, hey, the, thou shalt do it this way. Right. It's them saying like, this is what I think is the best way and and them being involved with me in developing that plan. So this isn't my plan, it's their plan. And so that you're going to get a different, a different uh, approach and enthusiasm and just like work output from those people because they're going to be enthusiastically doing it because it was their idea. Like it was right. their, this is their plan. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, I, I've had a lot more success doing that. And, but it, it took me a long time to figure that out because I was, when I first got into the position, I was very like dictator, like dictator, like, and I was, I was dictating to them. This is how we're going to do things. And if they didn't do it, I was, I was like scolding them or, or like holding them at what I thought it was the right version of accountability. And it was, it was weird because then I, I, I realized that that wasn't working. I mean, I was in there one yeah. day yelling and, and just <laughs> watched them all glaze over. And I'm like, oh, you're not even listening to me. Like, this isn't going to work. And I still wasn't getting the result that I wanted. And so then it evolved and I figured it out. And but it took I mean, it took me years to get to a place where I thought I was probably functioning as as what I would call like a, a adequate chief. Like and then I built on that over a long period of time. And now I think I'm a pretty OK one. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's interesting because a lot of people um, having the like having the humility to do that is strange because like I've been in positions where I went back to a submarine as a senior chief and like on the submarine I did my first chief's tour on because I was young. It was my second boat and I had a cob that just didn't think I should be in the control room. So I was trying mm. to qualify chief to watch and dive and I qualified chief to watch, but they wouldn't let me stand it. And then I stood duty chief but they wouldn't let me qualify dive. And so on my a third submarine as a senior chief, I'm the most senior guy on board, not named Cobb. And I ha I've never been qualified dive before. And I'm a cook. So I never got to drive the boat. I never got to do any of the same, mm. the things that kind of build the foundation for those types of qualifications. So it was really challenging for me to figure out how to do that when I didn't have that context. And so I would, uh, go up to these, you know, like E4s that had been driving the submarine for three years and be like, dude, teach me. And they're looking yeah. at me like I got 10 yeah. heads. They're like, yep. are you sure? <laughs> and yeah. it's like, yeah, man, you're an expert at this. I'm not. I need you to show me how to do this. And it it I learned more and got more support from my watch team through that approach than I think I could have through any other mechanism where it was just like they knew they could tell me things and they knew I would trust them and and listen to them. It's like if 
if my YN2 that sit and sticks tells me he needs me to move water somewhere or he needs me to like get ask for speed or he needs me to do whatever it's like i'm gonna do it as uh, and yes I, there's a, a a process happening where i'm i'm taking those inputs in and doing the calculus in my head but i'm their their opinion is going to carry a lot of weight with me especially a guy yeah. that's been driving the submarine longer than i've been qualified to anything in the control room it's like okay yeah. yeah no you're probably right let's do it <laughs> you know like um and so it was it was it's interesting to me that more people don't do that. Like don't approach it the way that you did where you were like walking around with your employees, learning their task. Or like, I, I really like the Fridays on the floor concept, which I'd love if you'd talk about a little bit, but yeah. the, the bridging that gap part. Cause I spent a lot of time talking about the disconnect between chiefs and, and junior enlisted or really chiefs and everyone, but um, it, <laughs> chiefs and chiefs and junior enlisted <laughs> is a big one where there's this, there's a trust issue there. And it's, it, it I find, yeah. I, I find it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be as severe on submarines, but it's still there and it's still a problem. And yeah. I think it's because there's not that separation like there is on surface ships. There's a lot of very uh, like dark, bold lines drawn where they yeah. have their own area to go hang out in. They eat in their own place. They like they're not you don't have ready access to your chief on a surface ship or in a lot of other large units in the Navy that you don't have the same access that that submariners do. Like my my division sees my sees me all the time. Like I'm always yeah, around. Yeah. And so they have, we have a relationship. I know them. They know right, me. Right. Like they, they yeah. feel like they can tell me things and they can trust me. And at the very least that they have access to me. So, um, can you, can you talk about that? Like how you, how you yeah. ar arrived at that solution to that type of a problem where there was that separation and nobody felt like they're like, it didn't feel like a team environment and, and actually turned into what I see in the Navy now between chiefs and, and junior listed and pretty much everyone is that adversarial you like us versus them relationship. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, it's, it's really interesting that you bring it up. We, the, the submarine was fairly unique in that, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of space. Right. Yeah, so, right. so we operated <laughs> together, right. We stood watch together. We spent hours together. Right. Yeah. So this is, you know, your most junior sailor to your most, you know, to your senior enlisted, to your, to your officers, we were all, you know, kind of in it together, close quarters. We knew each other. Right. And, right. um, there wasn't those, uh, dark lines between officers and enlisted and, and, and senior enlisted. So they, everybody was kind of, you know, we're in it together. And, um, so you can imagine, you know, I come to my first plant, right. At 32 years old. And I noticed that, um, you know, we have a manufacturing shop floor and we have these two office areas mm -hmm. and everybody's sort of in separate, in their separate worlds, right? So the office people did office stuff. Yeah. The people on the shop floor did manufacturing stuff and they really didn't blend and mix in any way, shape or form. They had, we had a common break area and they had some common bathrooms. But other than that, there was separation, physical separation between the two groups. And over time, you know, this has been, you know, this plant was around for a long time is that there was animosity between the people on the shop floor and the people in the offices. So there was this us and them atmosphere that existed in the plant. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself as a young plant manager, like, how can I bridge this gap? How can I, I mean, in the Navy, we worked together. We stood watch together. We, we knew each other. Right. I mean, I knew more about, <laughs> you know, the watch team in maneuvering that you stand watch with, you knew everything about yeah. every single person yep. on that one because <laughs> you're in a box, right? Four people in a box for, you know, in our case, we were standing six hour watches right? and uh, you knew everything about them, you know, past girlfriends, what they like to eat, what they don't like to eat, what the first thing they're going to do when they come, you know, yep. you, you know, everything about everything, right? <laughs> so, um, but but we didn't have that. We didn't have any relationships with each other. <clears throat> and I remember um, walking the shop floor one day. I, I used to walk the shop floor uh, twice a day in the morning and the afternoon, just trying to get people, you know, get to know people that could get to know me. And uh, I remember seeing a mallet that uh, they were went over to the station where we we're doing doing assemblies, and that they're supposed to use a rubber mallet to assemble these parts. And this this rubber mallet was worn down so. It, the, the mallet was worn down to the nub. It was just yeah. slightly bigger than the handle, right? Yeah. And I asked the the operator, I said, um, is that normal? And he just <laughs> smiled and laughed. He said, no. I said, I said, you know, is it damaged? He's like, yeah. It, and we just, and I said, well, why haven't you asked for a new one? And he said, you know, we're just making do with what we have. You, you know, the guys, I said, what about, have you talked to your supervisor? And he said, well, he's busy and I didn't really want to bother him with this problem. I mean, yeah. It took, 
it took years to get a mallet to look that way, right? <laughs> yeah. And so one of the things I realized is that there were things happening on the shop floor that the people in the office had no idea, right? Right, because they weren't spending enough time, and and there was there was a feeling on the shop floor that oh we'll take care of it ourselves. We don't need to bother right. management with this problem. <laughs> And that's when I, I I sort of thought about the idea of um, working on the shop floor. How can I how can I have some com, you know have these com, common experiences? One thing we had on the boat were a lot of common experiences where we developed a uh, we we developed relationships because we were sharing in things together. We were standing these long watches and what have you. So uh, I started on the first Friday of every month. I would I would work for four hours uh, on different places on the shop floor every month, and that's yeah. the way it started. It was just me. And I would, I would work, you know, side by side with the operator, learn how they did the task, learn where the challenges were, where the problems were. And, and suddenly it was like my eyes were open, like, oh my gosh, there's all these problems out here that nobody knows about. And so I would call my, I would call the management team in and I would every month and I would say, oh, I found this, I found this, we got to do this. And so I was all excited. Like I, I'd been given the answers to the test that we were all trying to take, right? Yeah. But they didn't get it. They didn't understand my enthusiasm because they hadn't seen it like I had, uh, you know, I had seen it. And eventually what we did is we had the entire management team do that. So we would have first Friday of every month, everyone in management uh, would go spend time four hours in the morning on the shop floor and uh, we'd rotate different departments. And then suddenly we'd, we'd have these meetings afterwards and suddenly it was like, we all got it. We were like, our eyes were open, like, oh my gosh, there's so many problems we have to fix. Mm -hmm. And it was so many things that didn't, didn't, um, that we didn't know about. And not only that, through the process, we got to know each other, right? So the people on the shop floor got to learn the management team. The management yeah. team got to learn the folks on the shop floor. And we built these common experience, a common view of where the problems were uh, that we didn't have before. If we learned it wasn't us and them. It was, you know, th these things wear out and we need yeah. new equipment or these procedures are wrong. They just need to be written. It's nobody's fault. It's just that they're outdated, right? And so we, we began to develop a common understanding of all the problems in the operation and we became a team. We became, yeah. you know, a unified team, but it was through, it was through the idea of trying to work together. And it was something that came from, from the boat it was like, how do we find <laughs> ways to, to work together and share those common experience and have a common view of the problem versus an us and them view of the problem. And, and right. I'll tell you what, I, I, I carried that out through all of my uh, manufacturing plants after that point. Yeah. And I feel like the, not just the, that they got to know their jobs, but they got to know the people that are in those positions. Yeah. And so like, it's it's a different thing when I know that like a a person who I, like I know the name of their kids and like I yeah. stop by and ask them how they're doing and what they did this weekend. It's a lot different thing if I know that that person like is working with inferior worn tools or broken equipment. Like I'm going to I'm going to feel like a need, an emotional need to like yeah. act and, and do something about that because that's what. I always talk about my my junior sailors as my kids. I always call them my kids. I, I've been <laughs> criticized for that a bunch on the podcast, um, and I just won't stop doing it because I like I look. I really do view it that way. Like these are my children. Like I yeah, I, yeah. and I will I will function in that way where it's like if they need something, like I'm gonna move heaven and earth to to help them and right. to do whatever I need to do to get them what they need to to be okay and. Um, and I think that that's a, a big difference probably between organizations that function in that way and don't is where I think in the surface community, the sailor, and I don't ha I only have like the secondhand knowledge for that's communicated to me through friends and, and people that listen to right. the podcast and stuff. But the feeling that I get is that there is that big disconnect and there's a very adversary relationship because there's not, and, and not that there's not great chiefs that do do the right things to establish that type of a, a team like environment and and connection, but um, it seems like a, by and large that a lot of junior sailors feel really disconnected and and alienated and or like just there's that adversarial relationship because there is no investment in or connection or they never see their chief out in the work center, yeah. like getting to know them, getting to know their jobs, getting and and, and what's weird about it is they there is shared experience there because that chief used to be them so that's what makes it even more frustrating for me is that yeah. how are we in that place where this chief it, it, like you know what they're going through because you've done it presumably yeah. like presumably you've at least done something very similar yeah so how are how are you not 
like, do you just assume you have that knowledge already or do you, you don't have to do it because now you're the chief. And so you're just like taking advantage of the role you're in and you just want to put your feet up in the office. Like, I don't know, but it seems like there's a big disconnect there and it's even more frustrating because it's not the type of environment you described for yourself when you were a junior officer. And, and it was like, you could have done that and just kind of like stick, kept that disconnect there. And it, I mean, it wouldn't have been good and you wouldn't have done as well. And it, it wouldn't have been productive for your team, but it's like, there's kind of almost like a built in excuse where it's like, well, you don't have the same shared experience they do. And in, unless you go seek that out, you're not going to have it. But these chiefs should, should know better. Like you've been where yeah. these people are. You work yeah. your way up yeah. to the position that you're in now. So that's what's even even more frustrating for me is that there's, it's like, you should know better. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I was, uh, I, I put it in my book. Uh, I had a friend who was a surface warfare officer and uh, he was on the USS Saratoga mm. and we got a chance to go tour the Saratoga. Yeah, I would think we were come back from patrol and he's like, Hey, you want to come down and see the Saratoga? And I was like, nice. yeah, that'd be great. I mean, that'd be awesome. First of all, I realized that, it, wow, the spaces are so much bigger on oh, the surface yeah. ship. Right. So Gigantic. I mean, it was like, you know, and then, and then there was this thing called officer country. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just officer study, right? Yeah, or yeah. A couple of ward, a couple of staterooms. It was like, it was a real officer country. And I remember there was a stairwell going up to what they call officer country. And there was a mirror on the wall and it said something to the effect of, you better start looking good. You're entering officer country. And it was like for, for enlisted that's uh, so for sailors gross. to get themselves looking good, uh, before, presentable before going into officer country. That's so and disgusting. I, just, I thought I remember telling my butt, I was like, "That's an insult." Yeah, that's that's that's, so that's gross. terrible. That is absolutely terrible. That should not be there. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that that's one thing. I was just really thankful that I did my time on submarines, yes. only because of there was not that that hard line separation between. Yeah. The different ranks and the positions. It was like it was people, right? Yeah, yep. I was I was a junior officer. I was not very experienced. I had butter bars, right? Yeah. But but I was in it, you know, I was making the same patrols as everybody else, right? I was right. I was suffering like everybody else. I was sucking rubber like everybody else. Right? We were <laughs> in it together. And I think that's something that's truly unique. Yeah. And in, in even almost in the military experience, it's, it's a truly unique uh situation. Submarines yeah. are pretty unique for that from that perspective. Shared adversity, it creates yeah. like bonds that you, you're not going to get in any other way. And yeah, I don't, I've never understood why there are such large separations between certain communities, even, even chiefs and junior enlisted where, um, I, like I, on submarines, like if I had my way, like if I went to a boat as a chief of the boat and it'd be like, there'd be no chief's table. Like you're going to sit at a table with junior enlisted and get to know them. And like, there's no you eating early. Like what? No, you're going to eat last. <laughs> like, like, like there's no, like all the privileges that like, and we barely get any of the privileges because I've heard of all this ridiculous stuff. Like officers yeah, you, on officers. And I think chiefs on a carrier have their own brow and it's like, what? <laughs> like, no. And like the parking, the, brow. the parking privileges and the like yeah. special areas and the, all this crap. It's like, this is counterproductive. It doesn't make any sense. Like I wouldn't even have meals in the wardroom if I had my way, like you'd have that yeah. space to go to. Cause I think there is value in in having a place to privately decompress and hang out with like your group and whatever. Like, I don't think that's a bad thing. Like I loved that there was a cruise lounge on a Ohio class submarine because on fast yeah. boats, you don't have a space to escape to besides birthing really. Right. And right. I think the junior people need that too. They need to go behind a closed door and talk about how chiefs suck because it's like <laughs> that they need to vent and like get that stuff out just like we do. Just like I need to go into the chief's quarters and shut the door and, like put my face in my palms and, and vent to like my, my chief family and then walk back out there and get back to work. So I, there's value in that, but like the, the separate, the artificial separation of, and like the idea that like, I have to put a, a CS in that room and like have them hand platters of food to officers. Why? Why? Yeah, yeah, like walk yeah. through the serving line and get a plate and sit down. You're just like me. Like you're yeah, not, that was you're always, not that was special. always a weird, weird experience for me. Uh, yeah. I just, I, I grew up, you know, in a blue cow, blue collar household right. and my whole family was my grandparents, my, I, nobody, nobody went to college. We didn't, you know, right. this was just a weird thing and somebody <laughs> serving me food and most, and, uh, yeah. I've noticed so. most people hate it at first. <laughs> 
there are some that like adapt to it in a weird way. Like they, they like feeling the, the mm. like special or whatever, but right. Um, and, and the more you get indoctrinated into the culture of, and you start to feel the sense of entitlement over a long period of time. So you'll see a lot of, a, a lot of more senior officers get a little more adapted to that. But even, even so, even them sometimes, like I've had CEOs that are just like completely disinterested and think it's stupid. And yeah. It's yeah. not, it, I mean, it, the, there's one thing I like about, I've always been a sucker for Navy tradition. So there's some like traditional things sure. that I've always, I always, you know, was, I love that stuff, but, but being served food was not one yeah. of them for yeah. me. At least. It was like, come on, you know, I, well, I'm and fine. <laughs> the history of the wardroom was an off. That's like where they stored their trunks with their personal gear in their like overcoats and stuff. And it was right, like somebody right. sitting on a trunk eating food off of their lap. <laughs> So like the tradition <laughs> isn't that it was like this crazy form, like that's where it got its right. name from. And it's not that there wasn't like, like the captain would have guests in his like quarters and that would be like more of a like formal ish, I guess, back in the day of, of sale. But it's like, this isn't a thing where it was like this formal, like uh, me treating you like you're this like special aristocratic, <laughs> whatever. I don't even it's ridiculous. It's a stupid tr- thing that is being like retained under the guise of tradition. And it's complete crap right. if you do any research. But but by the way, and I just have to say this for the record, because we we're always told that we went to fork and knife school. I never went to fork and knife school. <laughs> I have no idea what I was it's, doing. So <laughs> Yeah, well, if you went through like um, like and ROTC or any of that yeah, other stuff. I was like, ROTC, yeah. Yeah, generally, like, I think there's, pr- you might have spent five minutes on it. I know, like, at the Naval Academy, they spend time on it, and OCS, they spend time on it. But even then, I don't think they spend much time on it. Yeah, I so. don't, I don't, I wasn't sure which <laughs> fork and which knife, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I always hear that, and I said, I just want to say, I I never learned that. Yeah, there's whole <laughs> books on it, as disgusting uh, as that is. It's um, sad. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm curious. I spend, a, 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 and I've alluded to a little bit, I spent a lot of time on kind of le- the whole the whole concept of the podcast at first was to address a, a need that I identified for leadership development and education with, with junior sailors kind of on their way up through the ranks. But then mm-hmm. it, it's kind of become uh, addressing the the problem on both sides of not just junior people not having a resource as they come up because I, I don't know what it what it was like for you um, and I mean if you even had visibility on it really it is for enlisted leadership development and education on the way up all they had was uh, nav lead way back in the day they had these courses yeah. that that junior sailors would go to and then they got rid of that and it turned into command delivered petty officer in doc type stuff that was if it ever actually happened it was hot garbage so it it turned it it turned into like i was trying to address that need and then what i found was a lot of chiefs like a lot of chiefs identified with the message and really got a lot out of the stuff i was talking about and so i've it's evolved into more of a broader spectrum approach but i've the the long and short of it is I've identified this gigantic problem with leadership development and education in the Navy, at least, if not the entire military, where yeah. there's just this idea that we're going to figure it out on our way up. And there's no real um, <laughs> effort put into to studying it and the especially the unique nature of the military, right? Like like figuring out what the needs are on the way up and then addressing those needs and putting people in a position throughout their per- career progression to like get the reps in and have the correct mentorship and oversight. Because what yeah. you find is, is in order to do that, and I've seen this a lot and I see it, I could go on a long rant about like the training pipeline for, for culinary specialists in the Navy, which used to be mess management specialists probably back in your day. But yeah, um, the, how it's not only is the pipeline broken where they're not learning what they need to learn. And I know this cause I was the SEL of the schoolhouse, but the, when you get to the fleet, you can't look at a guy like me generally, even though I have a fancy culinary degree and a ton of experience. So I'm, I'm a unicorn, but the generally people in my position on a submarine, they don't have the formal training or knowledge to, to fill that gap either. So like you get to the fleet right. and it's just like the un, uneducated and untrained supervising and supposedly educating the uneducated and the untrained. So it's just oh, a yeah. self defeating cycle. And I see that in leadership as well, where they don't, you, you get these people elevated to these leadership positions and they're supposed to be the ones mentoring and training and, and educating. And they've never been educated and trained themselves in leadership or put in the right positions to become strong leaders themselves to then pass that down. 
And so what you find is that like a, a person has been set up to fail by being put in a leadership position without the requisite education yeah. and training and and has their behavior and the things that they believe to be true have been validated through promotions and awards to the point where <laughs> where you get a broken leader trying to teach a junior sailor and and that leads to more like attrition and just like the adversary relationship being compounded and the um the junior sailors getting disillusioned and with with chiefs and with the navy and leadership and everything and it's just like i i i get so like my head spins at the idea of <laughs> of like how did we get here why are we still here um the, the navy is doing this thing i have to bring this up every time i go on these long rants criticizing the leadership development and education construct is like they have established a native naval leadership and ethics center and they're doing enlisted leadership development courses where hmm. they're uh, certifying facilitators. And so they kind of came up with this hybrid approach where they're not going to completely pull you out of your command, put you in a brick and mortar schoolhouse, formally educate you and completely where it's this just completely dedicated mechanism. What they're doing is trying to pull guys like me who are on shore duty um, and don't have a giant command structure that we have to support. So like we're effectively the supporters and then you have supported commands that are like the operational commands, like a submarine where a guy like me gets certified as a facilitator. And then we organize a course locally. And then if the submarine can support schedule wise, they just get all their people to sign up and then they come off the submarine, go to the class. And then I facilitate it. So the submarine doesn't have to <clears> do anything. Interesting. So yeah. it, it's a, it's a giant step in the right direction. It kind of got derailed by COVID. So we're not really even sure like the, it's still being rolled out. A lot of places don't have enough facilitators. Like it's still being stood up. So it's kind of, effectively being beta tested right now. Um, I heard really great things about it. I've, I've got a couple of my chiefs going to the course to get certified as facilitators very soon. So I get to kind of hear about their experience. And I sent a couple of my junior guys to another base where they were running a course and they had positive feedback as well. So they're, they're taking steps to address it in, in a productive way. I think I just don't think it's, it's all the way there yet. And I think that there's a problem <laughs> when you are putting again going back to the like unqualified um like t teachers effectively is like the if the people in leadership positions now haven't been formally educated and trained and put in the right positions experience wise if you're going to certify those people to facilitate a leadership class it's like ah, are we are we doing this the right like I, there's no vetting process <laughs> there's just anybody yeah. can, any chief can sign up and get certified as a facilitator and then they go facilitate the course. So I don't know how effective it'll be on a large scale over a long period of time in, in improving leadership development education. Like I'm sure it'll help, but long story short, good Lord, that was a long rant. Um, how do you, you, I, I brought all that up because I'm passionate about it. Number one, but two, yeah. you, you said in one of your blog articles, like the, that line that I, I think I brought it up earlier, if you can't just send somebody to leadership training and expect them to be a good leader. And that was in that vein of they need those reps and they need that experience. So yeah. my question is like, how would, how would you, like, if you were king for a day, how would you fix <laughs> leadership development and education in the military? Because there is this strange, like, there's all these demands on our time. So do we actually have time to, th these are all like the excuses people have for me, which I don't right. agree with is like, well, we don't have time to pull people off the boat and send them to a class. And, and we don't um, have the, the facilities, facilities, resources or funding to like create a brick and mortar schoolhouse, even though we used to have one. And like <laughs> all right. these, there's all these reasons why we can't. And then we have ships crashing into super tankers. And then we have like yeah. mishaps where an entire ship burns to the ground and that we have all these crazy things going on. And, and like, you can just go search Navy times headlines and, and see all the leadership misconduct that happens yeah. Yeah. constantly. So it's like, there's clearly a need for us to get better at this and we need to get better at it on a scale that it like where it goes from like junior leadership levels all the way to the very, very top in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. So it's like, how do we organizationally and like, like fix this? It's like, <laughs> I know it's a giant question, but like, well, what? I mean, it's, it's, it's worse. I, I hate, hate to say this to you, but it's worse in corporate America. Really? It's absolutely atrocious in, uh, in corporate America because you get people that get promoted. They have zero experience yeah. and they're given very large roles. 
because they knew somebody or they, you know, they're a friend of a friend or whatever, and they get put in these positions of massive leadership responsibility right. with, no, with no progressive, you know, I mean, just like anything else, you have to start small and you, and you grow and, and you grow in your experience and you can take on more. And, and a lot of people get put in these roles and they've never, never led a small team. And now they're in charge of 600 people. Right. right? right. And it's, and it's a train wreck every single time. And, and the biggest thing, you know, that I see is that, you know, it, whether it's the military or whether it's in corporate America, the biggest thing I saw was that we don't treat leadership as its own special skill set. Right, right, right. So we teach you how to cook, right? And how right. to be, you know. How, I mean, how that's, to, that's how, arguable, but go ahead. <laughs> like, <laughs> do they? Uh. <laughs> I'm laughing. Yeah. <laughs> so do they? Yeah, but I mean... Um, uh, you know, so we, we learn our, our, our function, right? So w- whatever, whatever your, your rate is, right. You learn that, yeah. you learn that really well from the, from the schools on. Right. So mm-hmm. my son, right. I, I mentioned before the show, my son's in the Navy right now. Yeah. He's going to be a fire controlman. Right. So he is, you know, a surface guy. I don't know. Yeah. I couldn't talk him into subs, but, <laughs> but anyways, he's going through the training right now. And what do you think they're teaching him? They're teaching him weapon systems. They're right. teaching him. Uh, you know, how to fix the systems, how to operate the systems. He's learning all that, that great stuff. Is there any, is, so we spend all the time teaching people uh, their skill, right? Whatever mm-hmm. their, whatever their job they're going to be. We don't treat leadership the same way. We right. treat that as an ancillary training. Like, yeah. oh, you're a great um, sonar tech and we're going to teach you how to be a leader now. And here, go to this one course on leadership and now you'd be a great leader. Yeah. Well, why isn't, why isn't leadership uh, part of the, the training as you grow, right. right? As you take on more responsibilities that, that you are, you're given a part of your thread of, of training is leadership yeah. because that's going to ultimately be your job someday. Right. When you put on the anchors, when you put, you know, when you start wearing the khaki, you're, you're doing, you're doing less and you're leading more. Yes. Right. And that shifts over time. And yet we don't approach leadership like it's its own special skill set. We treat it, it's like it's like a plug-in, right? And it isn't. It's a whole different set of skills. Yeah. I look at it this way. I teach, uh, I do a lot of teaching at uh, grad schools. Uh, I teach at, um, I was just at Duke University last week. Mm-hmm. I come and I do these leadership lectures to grad students. Yeah. And I remember the first time I did it, I was down at the University of South Carolina doing a, uh, doing a presentation. And I asked the question, I said, how many leadership courses have you taken throughout your MBA program? And uh, one guy raised, kid raised his hand. He said, "You're the first one." Yeah, you're this was it. a interna- international MBA program, yeah. and they had a one hour leadership lecture, and that's it. Yeah. So they were learning sales, marketing. Yep. Uh, you know, they were learning manufacturing. They were learning ethics and law, and 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 all this stuff to be to be business leaders. Right. Right. And nobody was teaching them about leadership. I mean, the whole the whole <laughs> thing that's supposed to be their full time oh, job, wow. they are not learning. So I think I think it's a bigger problem than just the military. Yeah. It's 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 really well, we treat yeah. we treat leadership trivially in 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 the work world. In my opinion, we don't treat it as a special uh, set of knowledge. And yeah, a set of and I I think that it should be uh, and. It, I, but I, I look at it in the military like it's so much more egregious <laughs> that we don't spend time teaching people to lead. Like, I, I almost feel like it should be the lion's share of it. Right. Because from the very beginning, you can find yourself at a low level in a very important leadership position that could be you could be making life and death decisions. Yeah. And it's like that. So it's to me, it's so much more egregious that we don't spend just so much so like so much time effort and money investing into programs uh, like to make sure that we have the most robust and and like just qual high high quality leadership development and education programs in the military like at every level because i've seen i've seen other services i think take it slightly more seriously um, mm, I do. I, I think you're right. Actually, uh, I the do. Air Force yeah. has uh, an Airman Leader Program that's integrated mm-hmm. from the very beginning. Like we we shared a barracks with them when I uh, ran the CSA school, and um, the they had military training leaders that are like NMTIs, which I don't know if they had those when you were around, but it's like a 
it's basically like an RDC light, like a, a boot camp instructor light that mm, is at okay. the A schools. Okay. And so they do like yeah. them, they still do marching cadence. They generally are running the barracks, stuff like that. Um, and they, the air force has their version of that. And those, those, they had an airman leader program where they're wearing colored ropes to denote like what leader they are and what they're in charge of. They had like qual cards and a guide and all this mm, stuff. And I stole yeah. all of it and installed yeah. a student leader program for the A school. That was very similar. Um, and it, it, it's a, it, you saw a difference in the students immediately, just the visual representation that they were in a leadership position changed their entire demeanor. Like when they were selected yeah. to be a student leader and you uh, put a rope on them because we do like a little ceremony at, when we get back yeah, in class yeah. at, at formation. And it's like just they, you know, like the chest puffs out, they light up like a Christmas tree and it's a big deal to them. And then they start making all the classic mistakes that you see of like <laughs> ego and abuse of power. And, <laughs> but you get to teach them as they go, yeah, uh, like the yeah. most, some of the more effective leadership things. Oh, and we, it's, it, what's unfortunate yep. is that's only three out of 36 students that get to experience that. But it's it's something. And it's like then the students see it and they get to interact with that leader and then kind of maybe understands a little bit more about those dynamics. But it's like, yeah, they just we don't. The Air Force has airman leader schools at every at Air Force base. And it's yeah, it is more of like a from what I understand, it's more of like a collateral duty that where they like, it's like a local thing that some people are doing the airman leader thing. I think don't quote me on that. If you're in the air force and you're listening, I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, but that's the way I kind of understood it. And then they have, um, the Marine Corps has their own mechanisms. The, the army has NCO academies everywhere. Like they just have something. They, they take it seriously enough. They understand that leadership is important enough that they need to be doing something to address that specific skill set. And it's like until these ELD courses started rolling out a little over a year ago, we haven't take like no formal leadership development and education outside of command delivered programs until I got to the senior enlisted academy when I was mm. a chief at 16 years. I think. Wow. So it's wow. So, and I blew my mind because the senior enlisted academy is incredible. I spent. I think six weeks on Blackboard and three weeks in residence. It might have been nine weeks on Blackboard, something like that. But I spent three weeks in residence and it was incredible. They are so good at their jobs. And the yeah. curriculum was amazing. And they brought in all kinds of outside speakers and just all these amazing people. And it was so good. And I'm like, why is this the first time this is happening? <laughs> It, it just blew be. my mind. Yeah, it shouldn't be. You know, we have to teach people as they're as they're coming up, right? As they're yeah. as they're you know, given the, those chance, uh, the, the, you know, the article you referenced, you know, um, was you know, can you can you teach leadership? And you know, at the end of the day, yes, you can teach leadership. Right. But um, it's just like anything else. Like if you're going to learn how to play the guitar, you can't just sit and watch YouTube videos, right. uh, or you know, sit in a classroom and have a teacher teach you about how to play guitar. Leadership is more, you've got to do it. You've got to get your hands on it. You've got to actually, you actually have to do it. You've got to get the reps in. You've got to get the training or, or the experience to be able to be good uh, as your, you know, as your responsibility increases over time. So you actually have to, to be a good leader, as I say, you have to lead. <laughs> you yeah. have to be given those opportunities to lead and have someone there that can help you, you know, as you struggle and you have problems. So whether it's, you know, mentorship or, or peers or people that you can go to as you're going through the process to be able to have that right. reflective time. Like I had this happen with a sailor. Uh, I didn't, I don't think I handled it right. This is what I did. What do you think I, I should have done differently? Having that person yeah. that can help you as you are coming up and as you are learning. So yeah. yes, you can learn a lot in a classroom, but I think you have to get hands-on experience doing it in a controlled fashion, in a way that's supported, if you will, to be able to, to, you know, to gain the experience. And um, cause you're going to make a lot of mistakes, right. When you're a uh, young leader. And so you need to have some sort of a mechanism or some sort of a infrastructure where you can talk to somebody about it. Yeah. And I think that's part of it as well. It's not just, the training and the courses, but having people that you can talk to as you're, as you're developing your leadership skills, right. just and like anything else. I mean, if you think about it, every other rate, that's, uh, you, that's what you do, right? You right. come in as a junior um, sailor or officer and you, there's senior people above you teaching you the way, showing yeah, you the yeah. way um, of how, 
okay, this is how we operate these valves and this is, these, this is the reason for it. Okay, well, that's different than what I learned in school or I, no one ever said that to me in school, right? Yeah. So you start getting that hands-on education, right? And we do a really good job, uh, it, at least at my, my, my feeling in the Navy, teaching you your, your rate and your mm-hmm. skill or your job on the boat. But leadership is a whole different animal and I think it should yeah. be taught in a very similar way, you know, that you have senior people teaching the junior people, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and watching over them as they develop their skills. And I, know? what's interesting too, though, is I think that ba- based on the reaction I got from this podcast over, I mean, I've been doing it about six years. I've said seven years mm-hmm. a bunch of times on the podcast, but I, I math <laughs> wrong. I went back and looked, uh, it's about six years, but it, I, one of the things that surprised me the most was the reaction I got from a lot of chiefs where they were, I've gotten emails like you've, you've completely like changed the way I look at leadership and the way that I, I, I function as a chief. And it melted my brain when I started getting those messages because I didn't, that wasn't my target audience for one. And two, I just, yeah, I always had it in my head that these, these people at, at in those jobs weren't going to receive me the way juniors were. And so I thought the move was to focus on junior enlisted so that when they become senior enlisted, or what junior officers are listening as well, that when they become senior officers, they're going to be better leaders. And then it trickles down and and starts to starts to fix itself. But what I've what I've learned through doing this is that a lot of these senior leaders are just as hungry for leadership development and education. And when they found the podcast, they're just like, oh, thank God, you know, like and and they have sent like learned a lot and since altered their behavior. And that was what was interesting to me is in order for them to be the function that you just described, like to be the person that's course correcting that, that leader or sailor that is in that position and, and needs to be told like, Hey, this is how I dealt with this position, but I think, or this, this situation, I think I did it wrong. What would you have done for them to not get incorrect guidance or mentorship or just low quality <laughs> guidance and mentorship yeah. from that person, even though they're in that senior position because they stuck around long enough and got promoted a few times. It's like, they need to still be developing. And I think that the Navy needs to invest a lot of time and effort in those people probably first, like that's probably where they need to start versus like, I I would love for them to start at the junior level, but I think in order to fix it long term, I think the actual starting point is with like senior enlisted and senior officers. It's like, I think that if we spent a lot of time telling them how to actually do this and providing them the tools and education, everything else. Like it's not going to fix everybody because there's some people that are just stuck in their ways at this point. But I've been surprised at how, and and a lot of them are younger chiefs, but I've been surprised at how many chiefs have reached out and even senior chiefs that are just like, like I, I never thought about it that way, or you've completely changed the way I look at this, or I was jaded and bitter and angry and you completely like, like fixed like the list listening to this and hearing your dialogues with these people it like completely reinvigorated me and now i want to go out there and chief super hard you know and it's just like yeah i i did not expect that but i also think that it's super necessary for those people to be as functional as they can possibly be so that when they're in that position they're they're equipped to do those things yeah, you said something. I was listening to one of your one of your other podcasts. I think you had a you had a chief on, mm-hmm. and you guys were talking about um, you know some of the challenges. Yeah, and uh, one of the, one of the things that you said, and it really resonated with me, was that people play chief. You know, yeah. they they get in the position and they think, oh, okay, well, I have to act a certain way play now the because role, I yeah. have the anchors on my collar, right? Yep. And I see it. In, I saw that. I laughed when I heard it because I was like, that's the same thing I saw in corporate America, people were given a title Mm -hmm. or a role and then they suddenly became a jerk. Right. They're like, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm, uh, a leader. I'm the engineering manager now. This is the way we're (laughs) going to do things. Like, wait a second. Yeah. I I knew you just a few minutes ago and you weren't a jerk, right? Now suddenly you're the manager and you're, you're playing this caricature of a leader that that you you have in your head. Yep. And, uh, that's not what leadership is at all. At all. And, and so I think that part of the problem is, is that we have these <clears throat> false ideas of what uh, what a chief should be, what a manager yeah. should be. And then we p- try to play the role, right? right? Instead of being a human being and treating other yep. people like human beings, yep. right? It, and that's the thing that just drives me crazy that you know, <laughs> leadership is complicated. I get it, right? There's been 15,000 books written on leadership. Yeah. I get it. I wrote, I wrote two of those. It's <laughs> partly my fault. But um, 
but but I understand it's difficult. But in 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 actuality, it actually is is fairly simple. Yeah. Right? It boils down to some simple principles that if you can do right, you can be an effective leader. And I think that we <clears throat> sometimes we make we make leadership to be more complicated than it really is. Mm-hmm. Right. But that's why you know in, in all of my in all of my writings, I kind of go back to the the leadership as a people business. It's all about people. It's all about. Yeah knowing knowing your team and knowing your teammates and knowing what they're capable of and knowing what their potential is and and and, and getting them plugged into the way they can they can bring out their best right and operate in their absolute best and you can get the best out of them and you know it, and it's you know obviously it's the mission but it's also the people you know yeah. if you can keep that mindset that I got to carry out the mission and I got to help my people grow it doesn't matter what position you're in if you do those basic things you know yeah. you, you can be effective and you can be you know, you can put yourself head and shoulders above other leaders that are not doing those things, that the people that are trying to play leader versus being a human being and treating people with respect uh, from day one. I mean, just because you're, I, this drives me crazy is rank, right? And, mm-hmm. and I shouldn't say this because I, you know, I'm ex military, but, you know, people will play rank all the time. Yeah. I mean, how many JOs do you see come in and say, well, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the lieutenant? You know, okay. you have to listen to me. No, I don't. <laughs> really? Okay. Seriously? You've been in yeah. the Navy for four <laughs> years? Yeah, right. Okay. So, you know, and, and I think that, um, you know, I, I just think that it, it's about how you treat people. And even it didn't matter what my rank was in the military. I knew there were people around me that were more experienced and I wanted to learn and understand and, and have them teach me. So there's, yeah. there's definitely a, a humility that needs to happen if you want to be an effective leader. For sure. You have to sort of put the ego aside Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're in the role for a reason. You've been selected to be there for a reason. You have a, if you have a chest full of ribbons, you have those for a reason, but that's not who you are. Right. That's not, that's not really what's important. Nobody cares about your rank or your ribbons, right? They care about, are you going to treat me, you know, with respect? Are you going to help me develop? Are you going to be there when you need me? Are you going to have my back when things go wrong? They want to know, you know, can, can I trust you? as my boss. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think those things are really basic and, um, you know, we seem to get them lost in some of these, and, uh, yeah. training and some of the development. It's, it's really just about human skills. How would you treat your children? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a similar thing. How do you yeah. become a, you know, a good father or a good mother? Right. These are some of the basic skills you, you mentioned your, you called your junior sailors, your children. Right? Yeah. I mean, I've always thought of the people that work for me. They're like my, my sons and daughters. Yeah. Like I've got to protect them. You right. Know? Um, and so it's, it's, it's a mindset more than anything. It, it's and so I think some people come into the role with the wrong mindset. They, yeah. they, they come in and say, well, now I'm in charge. We're going to do it this way or whatever. And it's I, just, it's funny to watch. Yeah. And, uh, as a, you know, somebody has been watching leaders over 30 years. I just, I just, you know, I kind of, I actually watch people come in. I'm like, oh, like my wife, she's a school teacher. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'll see a new, a new headmaster come in and, and I'll start watching the things he's doing. I'm like, Oh, he's doing this right. Ooh, this is really good. And then, then he'll lock himself in his office for, for, you know, a yeah. month at a time and not even get out. I'm like, ah, he was, he was, he you were doing so, so well. Yeah. <laughs> I was cheering you on. Then you, then you disappeared. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I think a lot of that like weird approach, cause I think chiefs because of the, our, our cultural identity like this structure that we built for ourselves mm. it like creates it, like it, it creates an environment where it's it you were per- particularly susceptible to that like behavior of of in the absence of the f- formal military education and training required to create an understanding and equip you with the tools that that would allow you to know that you don't need to do that it's like i think we've created this environment where it's it's particularly easy for a new chief to fall into that like role of pretending to be this caricature that they have built in their mind, uh, like, because they don't know what else to do. It's like, even a- after going through initiation, it's like, it doesn't, a lot of that process r- only reinforces some of those ideas of that. I have to behave this certain way because I'm a chief now. And it's it's largely not true. Like there are some things like very few that it's like, yeah, there are some transitions you're going to have to make where your behavior is going to change because you are a chief now. But it's not it's not as as total as a lot of people treat it where you have to be this completely different person or you have to like create all these new divisions between you and these other people and act completely differently than you did yesterday as a first class. Um yeah, and I think, yeah, yeah I, organizationally, we're particularly susceptible to 
to setting up a new chief to start acting a, a certain type of way that doesn't make any damn sense at all. And they start they start falling in all, like all those like classic traps of of alienating their workers and destroying any trust they had and doing all these other strange things because they just it's like a shock in a, in a certain type of way that I don't think we do enough job a, a good enough job preparing them for for that transition but also just they don't know what else to do because they haven't been equipped with the tools and, and the experience and the knowledge necessary to not do yeah. those things to understand that that's not necessary and that's not the best way to take care of your people at all like you don't have to start like creating a character or like mimicking a character that you've seen in the right, past in right. that role it's like that's not productive it's like just be the leader that you were a couple of days ago and start building on that over yeah, time it's like the guy that would wash his coffee cup every day and then yeah. he became chief and he's like no <laughs> oh, i don't have to do that like, i don't have to do that anymore yeah, yeah you're disgusting. right I, th- I think that's and i think maybe the navy might even be more susceptible because that's such a big transition it is going yeah. To become a chief, right? There's a whole, you know, selection ceremony when you go through yeah, the chief's yeah. training, you, you, you know, and you get, you know, and then you change your uniform. This is mm-hmm. a big deal. I mean, people don't think about that, but you're right. physically changing your appearance, right? Um, and so I think maybe that's probably the mind, you know, you yeah. you physically change your appearance, right? You show up to the boat the next day and you're and you're different. Now you got a khaki belt, right? And, yeah. uh, well, I don't know uh, if she's still, yeah, still yeah. do they still wear it's, poopy suits on board? Please so they're called, they, they're, they are, they're <laughs> called FRVs cause they had to come up with a fire retardant variant of ah, uh, after okay. the Miami fire, but, uh, oh, it's ba- right. they're okay. basically the same. Okay. Well, um, but I mean, you know, the, you know, you, you come, you show up with a, with a different uniform and a different, you know, I mean, it's, com- you're complete. So there's a transformation that takes place, a physical transformation yeah. that takes place. And I think sometimes people think that they have to be different, right? right? Because right. they, and, and, and the other thing is like, how many stories have we heard about chiefs, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and stories, you know, see stories of this chief that did this and you sort of, you feel yourself, well, now I'm a chief. I've got to be this way, right? Yeah. Uh, this is, this is what I've t- been told over the years. Uh, all these stories, like this is what a chief is, yeah. you know? Uh, and I, and I don't know. I think that maybe we we fall in the trap, and then we we change the uniform, we physically change, and then now we think we have to change the way we treat people, yeah, you know, I, as well. I and think it's not a lot of know. it is us setting them up to fail, though, during the chief season. Like when we go through initiation, yeah. there's a lot of expectations created around what it means to be a chief, and I think that a mm-hmm. lot of the th- I talk a lot about the identity that we've built for ourselves. It's like if you read the CPO Creed, it's like there are things in there that. I don't really think should be part of our identity. There's some, a lot of goodness in it, but also like there's just things that kind of send the wrong message. And then there's things within just all like our, our cultural identity that we've built through. Like you could go to like goatlocker.com or or whatever it is. And it's like, there's a lot of crap on there that is, is very, um, it's like people made it up. Like if you look at the history of the charge book, it's completely fabricated because they did the Navy history and heritage command did a real deep dive research project. I have it uh, linked on the website under resources. It's called a tradition of change. Really interesting document. If you ever got some time and want a little light reading on the history, but history of chiefs and particularly the initiation process, but um, the it's completely completely different than what the, it has been presented for. And I believed a lot of the stuff for a long time that was on Goat Locker that that was presented as our history and heritage. A lot of it's not even true. So mm. it's like there's certain things that I think are just built on a faulty foundation that we need to revisit and just say, like, look, like, why? Why is our identity portrayed in this way? Why has it has it evolved in a way that like chief's pride is so important? Like, why do we have to be so prideful? Why, why is our identity tied up in coins and stickers and hoodies and t-shirts? It's like that. And and I'm not saying we can't have those things, but it's such a giant part. And and it's true. Like certain things like that, that are really pointless in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, yeah, it might add like some esprit de corps to your organization and like your team, like it, it'll build like your team identity and like co- cohesion a little bit, but like I, it's not that big of a deal. But it's treated like it is. It's uh, you act. It, it, we act like a lot of these things are co- are core pieces of our identity, and they're really not. 
And but if you asked a chief to recite the mission, vision and guiding principles, which, oh, by the way, are the individual trait blocks on their eval, most can't probably couldn't do it. They might be able Mm. to get like three, uh, three of them or four. Like most of them couldn't recite that. And it's like, okay, well, that's the core of who we are. And it's literally how we're evaluated in our performance as leaders. But most people don't know that that's what that is and don't like couldn't tell you what a lot of them are. And so it's interesting that you can tell people all this other stuff. Like a lot of them can recite the false history of the charge book off a goat locker, but you can't tell me the criteria on which you're evaluated. And to the, to the point that I've had new chiefs and granted they're new chiefs, but I've had like, I'm talking like within the first year or two of pinning, I've had chiefs walk up to me and say, Hey, can you like, and this took a lot for them to do this because it made them look stupid and to, to them. Like they felt like they should know this already. And they, sh- they should have is they, they came up to me and said, Hey, can you sit down and go through a chief eval with me? I don't really, I've never had anybody like, because mm. it, it's different. It's not the E136. Yeah. It's a whole different evaluation. Very similar structure and everything, but different criteria. Can you go through with me like all the individual traits and, and kind of the things I should be doing and like what this all means? Because it's all new to them. And I'm just like, how has no one done this with you yet? Like, OK, yeah. yes, of course. Sit down. We, you should have you should have known this a year ago, but okay. Yeah. Sit down and we'll do a deep dive and I'll go through it all with you. And when I tell them that like, this is the mission, vision and guiding principles. And they're like, huh? And I'm like, no, like you're, (laughs) you're literally your eval is the mission, vision, guiding principles. That's what they're like. Oh, wow. That makes a lot of sense. I'm like, how do you not know this? And granted those are new chiefs, but I bet you a lot of chiefs could. And I'm not, it's not a shot at chiefs necessarily. It's just organizationally, we've pushed things as priorities that we shouldn't. So it's like, it's just like a, we need to evaluate that and refocus and just say, Hey, what's really important. What's like, what is our actual mission? Like, what is the mission Mm. of the chief's mess? Okay. Let's, let's start there. Okay. So if that's the mission, how do we best accomplish it? And how do we need to refocus our identity and our efforts and our expenditure of time and effort to, to like march towards that, mission accomplishment like accomplishing our our prime prime directive like what do chiefs do well like we lead people like the and okay so what does that really mean like i the way i define it is like my my only real job like my primary duty is to take care of sailors like to get them every single thing that they need to like affect the mission because mm. I'm not a, like like you said earlier, I'm not a doer anymore. It largely right. like unless I'm sitting in the dive chair, and even then, I'm I'm largely a supervisor. But I, I'm not. There's not a lot of me doing. There's a lot of me supervising, training, mentoring, coordinating, planning, whatever. Where I'm I'm primarily focused on what can I do to set all of my sailors up for success, so that when it comes time to do the mission. They have all the materials they need, all their equipment works. They have the training, edu- quals, education, everything at home is squared away. They like they don't want for anything and nothing right. is distracting them from the mission. And they yeah. have all of the tools and abilities required to do that and do just do the crap out of it. I want them to be right. Right. the best mission, mission operators they can possibly be. So that's my that's my job. And so. Well, okay, so how do we best do that? And, and and refocus on those types of things and and teaching our leaders how to best do those. Like how okay, so how do we teach and develop and educate leaders that are either prospective chiefs or actually chiefs right now to do that the best they possibly can? And yeah. I don't think that we spend nearly enough time focused on that. And and I think that even like I, I've gotten in some arguments with people about like, well, are chiefs technical experts? And I'm like, well, I, I think it's a it's a spectrum. Like as a brand new chief, you're probably going to be a very oh, high yeah. level technical yeah. expert. But as a yeah. senior chief on your second chiefs to now I'm in a department chief role, the 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 scale is starting to shift towards leadership right. and management and coordination. Right. It, and and yeah. it should. Right. right. It should you know, that should fade away, right? Your, you know, your percentage that your lead versus do right. should get larger, right? As your, as your rank goes up, as you get more responsibility, right? right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's funny because the parallels are, are very similar in the civilian world, in the, in the corporate world, where um, what I saw was a lot of people get promoted into leadership and they're, they have a comfort zone, which is their comfort zone is the, the, the doer position. Yeah. So, 
you know, an engineer gets promoted to engineering manager and they spend their days uh, in their office doing engineering drawings instead of being, uh, you know, taking care of their people and, 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 you know, actually doing the job of leaders, leadership. And uh, there it's like, it's a comfort zone. Like I'm comfortable doing these things. Yeah. So I'm going to continue to do the, these things. <clears throat> Whereas I think maybe in the, in the military, it's not that way, right? Because I think when you become chief and you're, you're in certain roles, you're, you're clearly doing new jobs on the boat right. Right, than you used to do. Right. But then, but then, like you said, there's this, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, but there, you, there's, there's this expectation that now that you're a chief, you, you act a certain way, right. right. That you've been placed into this special group of people that, uh, you know, that hang out in the chief's quarters yeah. and, uh, talk about sailors or whatever. I, you know what I mean? There's yeah. like a caricature that you sort of that people fit into or they think they have to fit into. So it's not necessarily about like, like a comfort zone um, like it would be in the civilian world. But I think there is some, you, you position yourself, you go from being senior, you know, you, you know, a first class petty officer kind of senior in doing what you're doing to this like really drastic change where you change uniform, you get to new, you know, new quarters, new, you know, everything changes for you, you know? And, uh, and yeah, I, I just think, I think it's too big a transformation, I guess, maybe in what I'm trying to say is that maybe they should, it should be something that's eased in a, yeah. a little bit. So it's not just like one day you're not wearing khakis. Now you are, and you have to play this new role. So I think yeah. part, of the, part of the thing is that I think they throw it, throw it at you pretty quick, you know? Yeah. And I think that, I mean, I, I think it could be that if we, if we altered our approach during the initiation season a bit to yeah, cuz we yeah. th- that is a lot of what they're trying to accomplish um with with what happens during that process but it's like we could do a better job i think of of <laughs> easing them into it we spent a lot of time doing things that i don't it's like a sh- they they purposely shock your system and they're pushing you and challenging you and trying to get you to figure it out on your own and it's like i understand why it's structured the way that it is but i also feel like there's a yeah. lot more um, that could be done to create more of a structure and a foundation so that when they're in those positions where they're figuring it out on their own, it's like you'll see without fail every year a group of chief selects for the first two to three weeks are just overwhelmed and like shell shocked, like it just lost. <laughs> like they went from high functioning first class petty officers right, right, to completely right. useless in 24 hours and it's like they're trying to function together as a team and they're just like it's like they men in black brain wiped them with that little flashy (laughs) thing like they just (laughs) hard reset brain doesn't work anymore they don't know how to accomplish simple tasks they don't know how to work together as a team they don't know how to communicate they don't know how to do anything and it's we do we do that to them and it's like Yeah, yeah like why why do we waste so much time while they come out of that brain fog instead of creating an entrance into the process that is like a seamless integration and they're ste- right. just stepping that, right into the formal leadership development and education. Exactly. Thing. That's my point is that they've come so far. Yeah. When you're a first class petty officer. You have been a leader. Right. You know, you have moved you, your spectrum has changed from, from doer to leader. Not, you know, you could argue where it is on the, based on the rate right. and what have you, but your, your role has changed. Right. And going to chief means that that role is going to continue. That that leadership piece is going to continue to get bigger with the rest of your career, right? Right. But but it doesn't doesn't have to be this shock to the it system. It really right? does. It's just yeah. it is a it is something that's going to grow over time. And I think part of part of you becoming a chief is this this big transformation. And I think that we make it we make your 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 physical appearance, uh, your role on the boat so different that people react. Like oh, like they, like you said, their 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 brains just forgot yeah. all this other <laughs> other experience that they've had up until this point, right? And um, one of the things I noticed too, and and this is something I do every time I come to a business, is that I don't think there's sh- this is just my personal opinion. I don't think there should be special privileges for people in higher rank. Yeah. that's just always been my experience. I don't so either. <laughs> when I come to uh, like when I come to a new factory and I see like there's special parking places for the, for the general manager and the supply chain manager. I mean, I paint those over right away. Yeah. It's like, there's no special nope. privileges. Get for here early if here. you want good parking. Exactly. I've always said that you want a good parking spot, get here early. Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, I think part of 
when we do that, when we when we set set up like special things for people in special categories, then you create that us and them, right? You create that difference. Oh, look at you! You're special. You got your own your own. Uh, you got a wardrobe. You get to eat your food in, right? Yeah. Okay. If you've ever been to a wardrobe, it's not all that exciting. It's really not. <laughs> just the fact that there is there, right? Someone thinks that you're special. You're treated differently, right? Right. And I, I just have always been against that, right? I think that we, you know, I, one of the things. Um, uh, we, we had an HR manager in my first, uh, before I was a plant manager, we had this HR manager that made all of the people in the office wear ties. We had to wear ties to work. <laughs> so I'm in the engineering department and we're wearing ties in the office. Right. And so whenever we went to the shop floor, we had to tuck our tie in our shirt yeah. you know, and talk to that. And so the people on the shop floor called us ties. That was a nickname <laughs> for us. Right. Because they, they looked at, they walked, they saw us walking around with these stupid ties yeah. on, and we were creating this difference between yep. The people on the shop floor and the people office, we were different. We Those guys wear ties. We don't wear ties. Anytime you do that, oh, those guys wear khaki. Yep. We don't wear khaki. When, once you do that, you create that separation that, that, that it's the, yeah. it, it creates that us and them. Yep. And then when you, when you get into the club, when you get into the khaki club, you're like, well, huh, you know, I'm special now because I got the special khaki. Right. Right. So I think, I think we set it up that way when we give people all these special privileges for yeah. being at a certain, certain, in a certain role. Right. Um, you know, it's like, for me, like, like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the captain ought to have his own stateroom, right? And yeah. this, I don't think it's a special privilege. That's something that's actually functionally really important right, right. for that role, right? They need to have that, you know, a space, to, a, a, a space to themselves to be able to talk to sailors, talk to officers. So there's certain things that, 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 you know, maybe certain roles required to be able to do the job better, right? Yeah. Or, or properly. But I think every time we throw in differences between uh, one group and another group, we create animosity between those two groups. And I think part of just my observation, you know, is that there's, it's not even just the uniform, but it's this, it's, it's the concept of a chief. I mean, I can tell you as a junior officer, I was intimidated by yeah, chiefs, right? Yeah. Chiefs are like, Oh gosh, we're going to talk to the chief, you know? <laughs> so it's yeah. like, we're all, you know, junior, junior sailors, junior officers, we're, we're scared of chiefs. <laughs> yeah. So, and we shouldn't be right. They should be, actually, they should be the, the, the most, you know, knowledgeable, they should be a wealth of information for everyone, right. To be able to go to, because right. they've have, they've got the reps, they've done it, you know, and they have those experiences and those are the people you should be able to go to and talk to. But I think there's, in, there's an intimidation factor. You see those yeah. anchors and you're just like, Oof. and if you see an anchor with two stars, I'm mean, forget it. <laughs> I mean, you turn into a puddle, you know, I, so I gotta go, I gotta go talk to the cop. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I think fear, fear and respect, like too often get linked. Like they're too often yes. bad fellows. Yes. And it's just like, I don't need you to fear me. I have legitimate authority with rank or in the military that it's always there looming. And based on how we indoctrinate people into our organization, like they, I don't have to say anything like, like you just said, you see an anchor in two stars, like, you know, like, you know, there's legitimate authority there. And so there, there is innately going to be a little bit of fear there, but I don't need to like cultivate that. I need to just be the one that is, earning your respect and trust through my actions and behavior and knowledge and whatever. But then when we're in a position where um, we're, we're interacting, it's like, I, I found that I walk into a room as an inspector. Now I go out, I go on a submarines and, and I'm doing an inspection and people freak out a little bit. Cause Oh God, here comes master chief. And it's like, Oh I, yeah, about, I would be free. Right. <laughs> and, and I walk in the galley and you see everybody freeze and, it, oh, and then it, 100%. but yeah. it takes about 30 seconds for me to like break the ice and get them to all let their guard down just based on how I interact with them. So that's what, what I found is that it's incredibly simple as long as I'm the one initiating it. Exactly. So you just nailed it. You just nailed it, which is this, you have to break that ice. You have to show that. Oh, by the way, I'm a human being. Yeah. I'm just a guy. I put my uniform on one, you know, my pants on one leg at a time. I am just a guy in a different role than you. But I I think I used to be in their, in their place though. I used to do their role. So it's like, I'm not, I'm not special. I'm just old. (laughs) Like I've just (laughs) got the experience and knowledge over time, stuck around long enough (laughs) that I promote. Yeah. I like special. I'm not I'm just special. Old. I'm just old, man. Like I'm just an <laughs> older version of you. Right. No, that's great. And I think that's, that, I think that's refreshing to hear because I think, because you know what, you're right. Because just because of the rank, 
you're going to have a reaction. Yeah. But how you deal with that reaction is really important. Yeah. You know, if you say, oh, I like this. I like everybody running right, around right. scared when I walk in Which a room. Then, then, you, yeah. then you're just an owl. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So so I think I think part of it is um, is is being able to say that, OK, this is natural that people are going to react this way. How do I break the ice? How do I show them that I'm just one of them, just a, a an older version of them, yeah. you know, more experienced. But uh, but, I, you know, I always try to say, like in my organizations, that I'm not special just because I'm the vice president, right. general manager, plant manager, whatever. I just have a different role to do. Yeah. I just have a different job than you. I'm not I'm not any different or any more any special, more special than any one one of you. Right. I just have a different job to do. And that's it. That's I, I have this job called leadership. I have this job called, you know, coordinating all the things that happen in this operation. Right. Yeah. And um, you you probably don't want this job. <laughs> it's nothing special. Right. It's it's do, do I get paid a little bit more money? Sure. Uh, but do I work a lot more hours? Yeah. Do I yeah. you know, is, is the stress level a lot higher? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's I have a different role to play. But I'm not better than you. Yeah. And I think I think that is something that I've always approached leadership that way. And um, yeah, I mean, if you if you saw my, uh, we're not doing this on a video, we're doing it just audio. But if you saw my steel toe shoes, right? Yeah, I saw the picture you, on the the oh, blog yeah, post. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I put it in an article. Yeah, I put it in an article. But I was just like, I told my buddy, I'm like, you gotta take a picture of my shoes. People won't realize that these are the shoes of somebody who's been in leadership for 30 years. Yeah. It's not the shoes. It's not wingtips. Okay. I can yeah. tell you that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's getting down on the floor, getting time, spending time with people, really building those relationships. And um, yeah, I mean, you, yes, you have a certain job to do, but mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you have to be a jerk doing it. Right? right. You have to build those relationships. And I'll tell you what, I'm a much more effective leader knowing my people and knowing yes. what makes them tick and, yeah. and doing my best to fit them in the right role in my company to be able so they can grow and they can also contribute best to the organization. I mean, that's really, really important. I'm, um, right. you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I, I learned that as a, as a, as an officer, I remember, uh, as a reactor controls officer, I had a, I had a young petty officer that was, he was a problem. I mean, yeah. he was, he was a problem. He was, he would get in trouble all the time. Um, I, there's a lot of stories I didn't want to put in the book cause I, I didn't want to get myself in trouble with the Navy, but he, <laughs> he got himself in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, uh, but one of the things I found is that he was just bored. Yeah. You know, he was really intelligent and he would get bored easily. And whenever he got bored, he would get in trouble. And um, part of what my job was as a, as a leader of this young sailor was like finding a way that he, he that to, to use his brain more and keep him busy. Yeah. And when I did that, like he was a great reactor operator. I had him training all the new reactor operators. He, he was a great at, he could troubleshoot and fix anything. So I, I gave him the toughest maintenance assignments that we had. Yeah. When I did that, he was like, he just blossomed. He became a much, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a problem anymore. He was, he, he he just, he went off the radar stream as someone who was a problem, but before he was just bored. And, but as a leader, you have to sort of recognize, okay, I've got a great sailor here who's bored. How do I figure out how to utilize his talent more, you know? And, uh, you know, I could, it could have been a jerk and I could have written him up. I could have, I could have got all the things, but instead I was like, okay, what, what makes him tick? You know, yeah. and and how can I and I, how can I how can I get the most out of him, even with these personality quirks, you know, yeah. and, and what have you. And I think that's that's more of what leadership is: is just figuring out people and what what motivates them, what makes them tick, what what you know. I've got I've got an employee that works for me now, right? Every morning I say good morning, and he's always yeah. just grumbling. <laughs> he just is not a morning person, right? Yeah. By ten thirty, he's all smiles, yeah. telling me about his day and all that sort of thing. So I know in the so I don't even say good morning to him anymore. I always say morning, yeah. And he's like morning, yeah. You know? I just know that's <laughs> that's his personality, right? And so we have to know that about our people. Mm. We know that about our children, right? If right. we're a, if we're a parent, we know exactly how each one of our children act in certain ways, right? So we we know our children really well. We know our spouse really well. Why don't we know our employees really well? I, I never could figure that out. It's 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 about a personal relationship and, and we have to have those relationships with you know with our with our employees to the point where we know, you know, what what pisses them off, you know, yeah. what gets them excited, what uh what frustrates them, you know? Uh how do we and how do we tap into that? How do we help them grow? Yeah. It's a really important part. So. I'm in. Yeah. So I'm interested in knowing I, I, the last thing that I kind of wrote down from, I, I listened to you on the test up uh, guys podcast. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you kind of, you've almost answered my question without me asking it just now, but 
it was based on the I, I've always um, pushed back when people have said like they're, they're the concept you're going to spend 90 percent of your time on 10 percent of your people. Right. And like that yeah, people yeah. will push back and be like, no, I'm not going to do that because those 10 percent don't deserve it. I'm going to spend 90 percent of my time on 90 percent of my people. And I always thought that was kind of a, a, a simplified idea of leadership that I wasn't really a giant fan of because generally the 10 percent that that are having those like there are the ones that you're going to look at and say hey this this person's a problem like you just described there's a need not being met and it's like our job as leaders to figure out what that need is and then mm. address that and what you'll find the lion's share of the time if you get there early enough and you're able to like build the trust and rapport required and and, and address that need successfully is that that person's going to turn around and start to become a valuable contributing member of the team and so uh, and and i'll i'll concede that i go to extraordinary lengths to try to uh like re like try to rehab people like that are, are seen oh, yeah. too far gone and that everybody else has given up on and so yeah. i understand why when i go out on these like limbs with these these types of sailors i understand why people think that i'm wasting my time and i've been told that by command master chiefs like like dude you're wasting your time and it's like look i get it but i'm gonna waste my time air quotes until this kid is actually like I, beyond repair, like where yeah. I had the most recent case I had, like the kid showed up to work drunk after having all these other issues. And that, I mean, that was the last straw. And it's like the chain of command was 100 percent going to kick him out after that. And there's no, yeah. at that point, I mean, and I'm still going to help him transition out of the military and everything else. But I at this point, I can't save your career anymore. Like you've, you've right, just right. nailed in the you. last nail yeah. there. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm curious to like kind of to know what your like, where do you draw that line and how do you handle those those types of situations, especially yeah. I'm sure it's different in, in, in ways in the civilian industry, because like in the military, I view it as like, I mean, this is family, like this is a type of organization where like. I'm going to go to extraordinary lengths to help these people because I, it just feels different to me where yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I, I probably would do it in the civilian world too, but it's, I'm, it's cause the, the programming's already there. Like I'm already wired yeah, this way. Yeah. No, I, I am too. And you say family and that's the way my company is. Yeah. We, we are a family and, uh, unless, you know, and if you are having problems, I'm going to help you through those problems. Right. Um, and only if you put my family at risk is when right, you're going to get to right. find yourself out of a job, right? Yeah. So, but but in generally, I mean, I would say I'm a four strikes and you're out kind of kind of guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I you know I'm, I tend to be I, I tend to apply a lot of grace and I try I try to I try to work with people, mm. try to figure out why they're having problems. Right. But you know, I had a I had a um, one of my early employees of this company I started, and he was in a you know he was in a senior position with me at a, at a civilian company, and he came working for me and. He just couldn't make that transition to small company atmosphere, yeah. what, what's required to do the job. And, you know, and I worked with him for a long time. We, you know, some people argue that I work with him too long. Yeah. Uh, and, but I just couldn't get him to transition into the mindset of, you know, running a small company, which is fast, loose, quick, and dirty. <laughs> you know, he wanted to do everything with, you know, complicated systems and yeah. wanted to buy a lot of software and, you know, but eventually, you know, I had to let him go. And, and that's, <clears throat> It's you know I I hate to have to do that right, but you right. know no, you know now he's thriving he's in a Good. role where he's doing amazing work because he was in the wrong role yeah and I couldn't find a role within my team that really fit with his personality type yeah so it was a it was a bad fit right right, right. so but but I think in general I think we have to do our best to give people a chance to to you know to get aligned to to find a way to align their their personality their skill sets their you know, their hopes and dreams into the organization as best we can. We, we should try to do that as much as we can. Um, but, you know, sometimes we have to let people go and it's in, you know, like, like you said, sometimes it's the last straw and there's the only thing we can do, but, but I tend to, I tend to be a person that, um, that's a little more forgiving and, and tries to try to work things out. But I think one thing's interesting. You mentioned we spend 90% of our time on 10% of our problem employees. And there's a great book called uh, first break all the rules. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've heard of it. Uh, it was yep. written by the Gallup organization, uh, Marcus Buckingham, um, who was with Gallup at the time. And they studied so, you know, the best leaders yeah. uh, in the country and what they do differently. And one of the things that they said is that they spend more time with their best employees mm -hmm. and not with their worst employees. Yeah. And, uh, and they help, and they develop bonds with them and, and, and they help them grow and achieve the things that they want. So, so I think, 
you know, and our mindset is we got to spend all our time with our worst employees, but but really, in a lot of cases, and this is in this book too, they talk about is that people above a certain age don't change that much, right? Right. So they're wired a certain way, and um, we should spend probably less time trying to get people to change and more time trying to put them in the right role, yeah. in the organization, and then spend our time with, with the people that are are up and coming, the people that are going to be, you know. Um, the future leaders in our company mm-hmm. or, in, or in the Navy, how do we spend time with them, helping them, teach them, train them, right. having a personal interest in them? I think that's an interesting book from that perspective. It, certainly when I read that book, it changed my whole mindset with, yeah. oh, okay, wait a second here. I'm doing things wrong here. I'm spending my time correcting problem employees versus I should be I should be putting them in the right role. Maybe they're just not in the right yeah, role. Yeah, I was going to say- That I, helped me learn that. I like, yeah. the, I like the way that that's- that's described because it's not like it, by putting them in the right roles, you're cor- you're also correcting the issue, yeah. at least theoretically, like that, that the reason they're having a problem is that they're in the wrong role. So you're addressing that need and right. fixing the problem so that that bandwidth is freed up to spend on the people that it needs to be spent on. And it, yeah. it's like yeah. it, it, and th- again, theoretically, they've transitioned into the good category. So then you're still expending bandwidth on that person also. But mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I like that that is phrased that way because it's like you're not if if there's a legitimate problem like somebody's stealing or somebody's like showing up to work drunk and it's like maybe i can help address the need that that uh is creating that type of behavior but also i'm probably gonna have to fire you (laughs) and it's like yeah so then that's when it gets in the category you're hurting the family right right? exactly so so you you know you're you're my family but if you're gonna hurt my family I, I have to, I can't allow that to happen. It's right. the same, you know, you're, you're now a threat or problem. You know, you could operate a piece of equipment which could get, which could get one of my sailors killed. So that, that's when things change, right? So you're going to hurt right. my family. So things have to change. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You lie, cheat, steal, you know, you do things unethical. Yeah. You're not going to last too long in my organization, but if you're legitimately having some issues at home and you're, you have a tardiness problem and, and, it, and there's an explanation for it. There, there, that's where I'm, you're, you're, I'm going to work with you. Right. We're going to work through this, find out what's going on. You know, how can right. I help you? It, so it's interesting too. Cause it's like, it's not, it's not talked about like this in the military. It's like, those things are all the same thing. It's like, yeah, they're not, they, but they're, they're not. treated the same in a lot of cases where it's like, Oh, you're late to work. You're just a bad person. Like you're just, it's mm. they, they, a lot of leadership defaults to, uh, like the administrative accountability process. It's like, oh, you're, right. you've been late twice in a row, a counseling sheet. And it's like, okay, did you ask, like I, my friend Amber yeah. was a GM too and, and she was like a work center supervisor and she described the situation where a sailor was having issues being late and they counseled them like six or seven times and were about to send them to DRB. And she sat down with the sailor and said, why are you late all the time? And it was like mm. this big thing about like the car was broke down couldn't afford to fix it so they but they she was living out in town so she need just needed a ride to work basically and could never find a reliable ride to work but couldn't get out of the lease and just never got to share any of these problems with her chain of command because all they wanted to do was punch her in the face every time she was late and it's just like so amber fixed the problem in five minutes and all it took was her having a conversation asking that sailor what what what's the problem like why are you late to work yeah yeah and well you know it's funny because a lot of times the the people you know the leadership toolbox in some cases a lot of people think it's just a hammer yeah you know (laughs) there's a lot more tools in there that you have to use and one of them is just asking why right like and 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 listening and and shutting your mouth and listening yeah (laughs) you know to to what the problem is so yeah you can't you just can't be hammering and every time yeah, you the see number of, problem. of yeah. of answers that I've gotten that I just like I just like cock my head like a confused dog and I'm just like why didn't you tell me this a week ago I can fix this with a phone call like right. I'm just like do right. you not trust me do you not believe that I'm here to like fix these problems for you I'm like what why did you live with this issue for so long and yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And then they, I, I get, and then I get to like fire for effect and demonstrate to them that like, oh, I'm, I'm not just, I'm going to fix this problem like so hard that you're never going <laughs> to like, you're never going <laughs> to ever have this type of an yes. issue ever again. And you're going to know yes. 
through that demonstration of me, do, my doing that, that you can come to me with this stuff and I'm going to fix it, or I'm going to take you to someone that can fix it, or I'm going to find the resource or yeah, yeah. leverage someone or do whatever I need to do to get you what you need. That's my whole job, but you got to tell yeah. me. And, and yeah, and it's, it's, I, I like what you said though. That's really important. And, we, and, and don't, you know, we should as leaders never forget this. When you said fire for effect, it really yeah. resonated with me because I think sometimes when we go overboard, <laughs> and we do something to send a message mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, we care or we're, this is important to us or whatever, that, that message resonates throughout the entire organization. Yeah. The, the rumors happen, yep. right? That, that, oh, wow, you know, this guy came, you know, came with a problem. This is what happened. It's like, man, yep. you know, this guy's great. This is, you know what I mean? So a lot of times I'll do things knowing that a rumor mill is going to start yeah. because I did <laughs> this one thing, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, you know using using the way using the, the organization is going to react a certain way to 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 you doing something and you do it on purpose yeah. as a way to send a message that this is important yeah. to me. So I do I do believe in doing things like that uh, to to send a message to the organization. I, that, oh wow, yeah, John 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 really feels strongly about this. Right? Yeah. this is what he did. I, you know, because that the rumor mill is, the rumor mill is great. Yeah, so. I only recently, and I say recent, probably in the last three years, I've started to really notice the effect that my yeah. actions can have like on the entire command by my just yeah. like, so if yeah. I do a thing, I do it with the knowledge that this is going to then communicate to the entire organization. Like, Hey, this guy is somebody I can go to with these types of problems. Yeah. And I, and I've noticed yeah. that for the longest time it's, it, it's just compounded. Like I have, I have people calling me all the time that like didn't even work for me that are just like asking me questions or asking me for help or asking me, like what they should do in a particular situation. And it's like, I, I don't I, like you never, you're like a, a nuke or like a, I got like sonar texts and like people calling me that they're like, why are they calling you? And it's just like, cause I was the chief in the command that would advocate for them. I would go grab yeah. the cob or go grab the engineer or the XO and say, Hey, this guy's having a problem. They need this. Like we need to do the, you know, like, and it wouldn't, or I'd go grab their chief, you know, like, and say like, I was a chief they could talk to about things that, they couldn't talk to their chief about, or they felt like they couldn't talk to their chief about, right? or their chief wouldn't understand or whatever. And it's like a lot of those people couldn't have a conversation. Like just like I had a new electrician come to me one time and I didn't even realize I had done it, but I had established this trust and rapport with him where he would ask me questions and with no fear of reprisal or no fear of like me barking at him or whatever, like a lot of caricatures of chiefs will do. Where yeah. he just asked me, like I would correct, I, I was the guy that corrected people for having their hands in their pockets, and he was, but I would do it in a in a way that it was kind of like a joke, like I'd make them laugh as I did it or whatever. I'm like, yeah, did, yeah, like, did I yeah. do something to hurt your feelings, dude? Like, what are you what are you doing? And they're like, no, yeah. like, what are you talking about? I'm like, why do you have your hands in your pockets? Do you not like me anymore? Mm. Like, and I would just like, like, are you trying to hurt me? Because that that like hurt that like hurts my soul, and um. But so I, he asked me one day, he's like, like, senior, why do you care so much about people having their hands in their pockets or their boots not looking bad or whatever? He's like, why do you, why do you, are you so invested in this? And I, so I sat down and I explained it to him and I'd like, it, a lot of it is just a respect, like a deep respect for the, the, what the uniform means symbolically. A, a lot of it is the classic, like just the way in which you present yourself, um, like communicates a lot to people, uh, just there's a lot of different things, but a, a big part of it is I came into the organization with a deep respect for it initially. And then I've only deepened it through my study of history and heritage. And I just, and, and a lot of the way that I've, I've um, combated this idea because there's, and I'm sure you're aware of it, but like this idea that like cooks are dumb and they don't add value to the mission, right? Like that we're mm-hmm. somehow like less than, the way that I've combated that, not just in my own mind, but as I've led cooks and then I, I went and ran the CSA school and I had a lot of students that didn't want to be there because they thought they were in like the worst right in the Navy. And so like just the study of heritage and, and sharing those stories and the importance of them. And it's just like it, it and then my communicating an image of that that career field to the fleet. It's like it was really, really important to me that I never demonstrated to anyone anything that would compound that stereotype. So I was always hyper aware of my uniform appearance and and my grooming standards and my professionalism and the way in which I spoke and just everything. 
um, so that it, you can never use me as an example of like perpetuating that stereotype. But also, you, a lot of people would use me as an exception of the rule. And it's like, well, it's because it's not a rule, dummy. Like we're just people doing a job, and it, like you can't right. categorize people based on the, the job they're doing as some kind of like like they're intellectually inferior. But um, yeah, I just no, explained you know, all those things to him, and I, I didn't even realize that. I was that guy and but I had people come to me with stuff like that all the time where they'd want to have those conversations and I don't think a lot of sailors have those conversations with their chiefs. No, they don't. And one of the things that I really what, what struck me in that conversation is that you explain your why. Mm-hmm. You explain your why, right? Why you know, why why are you bugging me about my hands in my pocket? Right. Well, this this there's a big reason for it, right? right? And and and, it, and you you just you just spent some time telling me your why. And it's one of the things I found in a leadership position. If I, if I include the why sometimes, maybe not every time, but yeah, um, it, it's enough to like get people to understand. Oh, okay, that's why. Like for example, when you're on a forklift, you but you have to be wearing your seatbelt. Yeah, and 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 I'm very I'm much a stickler to it, and everybody knows that. Like if they they drive by me in the forklift, they know I'm going to look for their their seatbelt, and. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of times the first time, if it's a first time employee that's not wearing the seatbelt, I'll, 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 you know, Hey, turn off the fork. Let me just explain a little bit about why I'm such a stickler for this. Right. And, and I'll walk through the safety side of it. And it's like, look, I care about you. I don't want you to get hurt. And, and, and you falling out, if there's a, there's a problem and you could get crushed, I said, I don't want that to happen. I care about you. And when they suddenly see the why it's not. Oh, he's always bugging us about seatbelts. No, he he cares deeply about us and doesn't want us to get hurt. Right. It's a different value set. And I think you've installed the importance of of it so that when they're they're not necessarily going to do it because they they're worried about their own safety on the forklift. They're going to do it because it's important to you. And it's like yeah, it's it's yeah. you've taken the time to like communicate the value of it and and like it kind of builds a relationship and now they don't want to like let you down. And so mm. like I noticed that too. Like I would walk into a room when I yeah. was on that submarine and in a lot of other places and everybody would meet the first thing they would do is like if they had their hands in their pockets, they would take them out. And it's like, <laughs> does that mean that like I fixed the problem of people having their hands in their pockets? No, but they became aware of it. And just out of yeah. respect for me, they would take their hands out of their pockets without me having yeah. to say a word. And it's yeah. just like yeah. that meant a lot to me that like they're doing that for me, not because they believe that. <laughs> like they shouldn't have their hands in their pockets. No, they understand your why. Yeah. Right. And they, and they want to respect that. Right. So I think, you know, I mean, obviously we can't all the time, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, your kids, you're, you're, you know, you have a young child, they're going to put their hand on a stove burner, yeah. you know, a stove. And you're like, no, don't do that. You can't explain the why. Right? right. You know, maybe in the future you can, but sometimes you're just reacting to things that you see. Right. You've got to, you've got to correct. Right. But, but I really do believe if you can get to where you, where people can understand your why, why you do things a certain way, uh, especially as an experienced, you know, you were talking about like, I'm, I'm just the same as you, just older. Yeah. But <laughs> as we get older, we gain a little bit of wisdom and most we get wisdom by make, by, because we've made bad decisions in the past. Right. right. So we gain that wisdom. But I think when we explain our whys, I think people are generally more, instead of just saying it's because I said so, it's yeah. because I'm the, the master chief or because right. you know, I'm the boss. No, it's because I don't want you to get hurt. I care about you. That's a whole different, you just went down a whole different street, right. you know, and, and it changes the whole dynamic. Uh, and, and so that's why I think you under having people understand your why is really important. Yeah. 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 Yeah, man. Uh, it is. We're coming up on two hours. I feel like we're at a natural wrapping point uh, for this yeah. one, at least. I'd love to talk to you again, but um, w- w- can you, for just for everyone's uh, essay, can you put out like the where they can? Because you've mentioned the books, and I know you like you have the the website and the blog that I've mentioned a few times, which I think is yeah, really great. Yeah. And I'm sure I'll digest more of that. But just tell everybody where to find all those things and what they're called. Yeah, so everything can be found at uh, johnsrenny.com. And uh, that's I have two books out, uh, I Have the Watch, and uh, All in the Same Boat. They're both leadership books. Um, second book has a lot of sea stories in it. It's about nice. how I took my experiences in the military yeah. and, and submarine community and brought it into the corporate world and how it helped me kind of grow and, and uh, achieve things and, 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 and even move into a startup company. So that's kind of a fun book, a lot of sea stories. Um, but, uh, johnsrenny.com, you can find everything. I'm pretty active on Twitter and 
Instagram, that sort of stuff. Yeah. So uh, yeah, please uh, reach out, connect, and I'm happy and to then talk with anybody about what's, these issues. What's the podcast issues. called? So my podcast is called Deep Leadership, yeah. and it's where you can find any anywhere you can find uh, podcasts. It's out there, and I interview entrepreneurs, leaders, uh, military leaders. Um, just we talk leadership issues, hundred percent all the time. Awesome, um, fun stuff, real good stuff. So uh, um, yeah, it's a good good podcast. Usually they're they're less than forty minutes each episode, so oh, wow. they're kind of fun. Yeah, <laughs> easy, to, easy to listen to on the way into work. <laughs> Two to three hours, <laughs> so. kids. You know the drill. <laughs> hey, that's right. That's what you like the Joe Rogan, right? Oh, I do the three hours. yeah the spin the yarn <laughs> ones where it's just me are generally I, well some of them are longer, but a lot of them are like twenty thirty minutes. So I try to yeah, do both, yeah. but. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. I really, really appreciate this. This was, this was a lot of fun. I got a lot of definite insight as I, as my retirement is looming. So I'm sure. Ah, oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. No, you'll, you'll do fine. I think, uh, but again, the pace is different. So yeah. It's a, it's a whole different world. It'll be interesting. <laughs> so. I'm sure. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. I definitely did. Uh, I, I will definitely be talking to John again, uh, about a lot of different things. Um, and I think that people like him or their inputs are so valuable, not just because, uh, he has his own unique perspective on leadership and everything else, but the experience of the military and then translating that over to the civilian world. And it's like, you learn what works and what doesn't. And then you get to learn a lot of lessons that we don't learn in the military. So for a guy like me, that's only done the military things his entire adult life. I get to learn lessons from him uh, via his experience in both worlds and him having realizations of like, oh, this works and this doesn't and this is why and and applying all of those leadership principles that that I think are relevant uh, to the civilian world and then saying what works and what doesn't it, it like through actual real life application. I think it's really valuable. I had a lot of fun talking about those things and, and just wondering, like if you put a military leader in a civilian workforce, how does it all translate? Will they be successful all the time or, or is there, are, what are the adjustments, all, all those things? And I really enjoyed exploring that. Um, I hope you guys did as well in the show notes. If you want to check out his books, his blog and all, all the different things that he's got a lot of content out there uh, for you to check out um, deep leadership podcast, all those things, the links are all in the show notes. So go check those things out as well. Um, separately from that, if you would be so kind as to like, share, subscribe and review the podcast on all the platforms for all the things, social media, iTunes, all those things that helps us out. Um, if you need anything from us, hit us up. Don't go off the ship podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message us. Don't give up the ship podcast, or you can DM us on Instagram or Reddit or discord or five other things. I can't remember, uh, at DS podcast. We're there. We're active, uh, still learning how to use some of them, but whatever. And then, uh, also we are launching D gets apparel. By the time this podcast drops, it's sh- the site should be up. D gets apparel.com. Uh, don't give up the ship apparel on Facebook and at D gets apparel on Instagram. Please go check that out. And if you want to support the podcast platform, it is a for profit business model in long term, right? But um, it's I'm effectively using it as a sponsor for the podcast now because uh, <laughs> like this stuff where I was just selling the the podcast shirts and stuff while nice, it like doesn't pay the bills. So um, and I mean like the podcast bills. So like, uh, but eventually like if the ho- hopefully DS apparel becomes so big, it pays my literal bills. But who knows? But for now, it's like functioning as a as a sponsor for the podcast platform, and then whatever it becomes, it becomes. But I'm really excited about it. I put a lot of time into it over the last probably eight or nine months of just developing them and designing all the shirts. I did I did it all myself. Um, taught myself how to re, well retaught myself. I grew up doing graphic design things, but um, kind of got back into it after a really long break and re- retaught myself during some of the quarantine time uh, how to do things in Illustrator and Adobe things and whatever, and built the website and did all those things. So. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of it. I like, I, I like what I've, I was able to put out there and I hope you do too. And, um, and let us know if you have ideas, if you want us to design a shirt for your warfare community or, or, uh, rate or whatever, or you just some idea that you think would be funny and then you'd love to see on a shirt, drop us an email or hit us up on any of those platforms. And, uh, I would love to do that for you as well, but yeah, I'm excited and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone's reaction. So check out, check that out. Dgutsapparel.com. Uh, yeah. And that's it. That's what I got for you today. Thank you so much for listening and don't give up the ship. 